As a member-led organisation, it's important for me to travel around the world meeting people who work in the industries we represent. Today, I'm in my home country of Wales visiting one of our corporate partners, meeting some of our members working in aerospace manufacturing and seeing some of the innovation that's happening in the aerospace sector right now. It's an exciting time for space, aviation and aerospace, as our sector focuses on making huge technological advances to address the climate challenge. A career in aerospace offers the opportunity to be an integral part of this work, such as being involved in hydrogen and electric power and new areas such as eVTOL and drones. We're accelerating developments at such a pace that people joining our sector are going to be doing and achieving things that I can't even imagine. If you work or want to work in the aviation, aerospace or space sectors, joining the Society can provide you with a lot to help you on your journey. As well as being a member of the only global organisation dedicated to advancing each of these sectors, you can also access specialist career development advice our learning management and CPD platform aerodiversity, networking opportunities, meeting your peers and people who will genuinely inspire you in your career. Our events, conferences and lecture programme and as a member-led society, there are great opportunities to get more involved. Through our branches and divisions, which have a presence right across the world, through our 21 specialist groups covering areas as diverse as air power, rotorcraft, space and even human-powered flight, adding to public debate and providing expert input to policy making and through our work to support apprenticeship standards as a registered endpoint assessment organisation, supporting the next generation of aerospace professionals. And all of this is underpinned by our fantastic primary and secondary education outreach programmes, introducing young people to the wonderful world of aerospace and aviation. Growing up in Wales meant that it was only a chance encounter with a local farmer who flew light aircraft as a hobby that made me look towards aviation as a career. But in case you don't know any Welsh farmers, I'd encourage you to reach out to the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you're thinking of joining or would like to know about getting more involved in our work, head to our website, drop us an email or visit our social media pages. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Aeronautical Society 2023 Tony Larkin Mem Memorial Debate. So my name is William Lee. I'm the committee member of the Society's Air Transport Specialist Groups. And today's event is organized by the groups in, mem in memory of Tony Larkin. So Tony Larkin was one of the most active members of the Air Transport Specialist Groups Committee. He has always been in to participate the group's discussions and debates, never afraid to express an alternative view. He organized very successful debates at the Society, and we hope to continue his legacy by hosting the Tony Locking Memorial Debate each year at the Society. So before I move on to introduce um, today's speaker, there are a few housekeeping points that I would like to uh, clear out of the way. So today's event is powered by Microsoft Teams and unlikely the usual Teams meeting. Uh, your cameras and microphones have been disabled, but throughout the event, I do encourage you to use the Q&A panel to raise any questions that you may have. Please refer to the question mark buttons at your screen. Today's session is being recorded and the Society will release the recordings on the Society's learning platforms afterwards. Today, we are delighted to welcome two distinguished speakers to present arguments on aviation finance and the insurance market and its effect on the view in view of the Ukraine conflict. So first, I'm very delighted to welcome Professor David Yu, who is a senior um, ASTED certified aviation appraiser. Professor David Yu is a professor in, of practice in finance at the New York University Shanghai and Stern School, and is a recognized expert and thought leader in cross-border investing, financing, evaluation, real assets, and um, 
Aviation. He is the chairman of Asia Aviation Valuation Advisors and China Aviation Valuation Advisors. He is the only International Society of Transport Aircraft Trading Certified Senior Aviation Appraiser in China and North Asia, and is one of the 20 globally. He is also act as a board director or advisors of companies and funds, including airlines. Professor Yu is a CFA chartered holder and a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Our second speaker is Tassos Michael. He's the CEO of Inception Aviation Holdings Limited. So he's a former UK as a finance lawyer and has working uh, as worked in aviation since the late 1980s. Beyond aviation, he has a background in shipping, ship finance, and was very active in cruise sectors. Tassos was a diverse experience in the aviation sector from uh, commercial to finance, which includes helping to form four stopper airlines and several leasing platforms where he is credited with some of the highest returns in the sector. He advised airlines, funds, banks and the senior ex externals at McKenzie. So with further ado, let me hand over to uh, David and Tassel to bring us these 2023 Tony, uh, Tony Luckin debate. Thank you both. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully you guys can see uh, the slides that I've uh, put on. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, William, for the kind introduction from myself and, and, and Tassos. Uh, I'd like to thank the Royal Aeronautical Society as well as the, uh, the Air Transport Specialist Group uh, and the members of which uh, I, I'm a part of. Uh, as well as uh, our other uh, colleagues here in, in the group uh, listed here. Um, <clears throat> David, hello. Um, and again, thank you to um, all the participants for attending and uh, just to introduce uh, David. Uh, David and I have worked together uh, for nearly two decades and apart from his uh, um, uh, academic achievements uh, is very um, uh, well versed in the uh, acquisition and trading of aircraft. Uh, and we had heard a, uh, a a short bio of Tassos. Tassos has been in the industry uh, and is very experienced, uh, having started uh, helped start four airlines, uh, as well as uh, leasing platforms, which I helped uh, uh, co-found uh, with him. Uh, Tassos is very heavily involved uh, with a large fund right now, investigating and purchasing insurance claims and the underlying debt related to aircraft. Uh, detained in Russia. So he's got a very unique perspective uh, uh, for the subject matter we're about to discuss. And in some cases have reviewed uh, the documentations of over 40 uh, parties uh, claims, uh, policy claims. So a lot of uh, knowledge uh, bringing you to this as well. So with that, uh, we're going to uh, start with the, uh, um, just give you a sense, everyone. So we're, we're both going to give a, um, some background and then we're going to uh, uh, pose all the questions uh, for the debate as, as we uh, go go along and and there'll be time for Q&A uh, which we'll take from the audience. Um, as, as all of you guys know uh, aviation finance uh, and, and really uh, aircraft fleecing really started in the 70s uh, out in California with IFC in Ireland and GPA. Uh, this is really the start of the industry uh, and it has boomed all, ever since. Um, you can see in this graph in the bottom, this is really uh, what we've seen over the last, the progression of the air travel industry. And, and you can see the exogenous shocks that we uh, that are labeled uh, as such. Um, uh, the latest of which is obviously uh, COVID, which which is is a blip and largest exogenous demand shock that the industry has hit faced, but we seem to be coming back 
uh, from that uh, all around. Um, you know, some places more than others. UK, uh, Europe, and US coming back much strongly, more strongly than in uh, in Asia. Um, I, I would like to say that you know the major hubs of leasing is Ireland, Singapore. Uh, and, and, and Hong Kong, uh, and, and there's a and mainly due to the, the government support, strong government support and, and tax regimes, uh, along with the service sectors that, that service the industry. Uh, you can see from these Boeing um, capital uh, uh, <clears throat> slides that uh, basically leasing has been uh, growing at a pretty good uh, clip. Uh, during COVID itself, leasing actually uh, went over 50% of all aircraft delivered, and we're basically around slightly under uh, 50% at the moment. You know, um, especially this coming this year. Um, so a lot of this introduction will come from our Tassos and I, um, our our paper uh, that was uh, published in the uh, Journal of Structured Finance. You know, if you guys are interested, you can feel free to uh, download and read the papers yourselves. And uh, we we've also collaborated uh, with uh, a, a previous uh, article on asset-backed uh, securities (ABS) aircraft ABS and uh, and workouts, uh, given that. Uh, this topic, there's a lot of issues that come uh, are derivatives of, of such. Um, as you guys uh, in the audience probably are well aware, we're coming up to pretty much the one year anniversary of the start of uh, of the Russian uh, Ukraine war. Uh, and, and, and obviously the, this the activities came before that, and there's a lot of progressions in this, which will go uh, going forward. Ultimately, there is a lot of impact uh, that this has created all around the industry and especially in aviation finance. You know, economically, uh, this has created a lot of uh, waves uh, driving up pricing, commodity pricing, especially especially in, in Europe, but but all over the world through, com um, uh, especially in agriculture and, 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 and energy. Um, Given GDP is very correlated with the growth of the air travel industry, this is going to this has big effects, uh, and and we continue to see it. Uh, there is on the bottom you can see this air, air physical aircraft losses, and we'll we'll go into much more detail there. Uh, supply chains is needs to be re, rethought, um, given the disruptions uh, of such, uh, and in the in the uh, air uh, air financing side, ABS or uh, aircraft ABS have been downgraded. Uh, certain uh, debt has been downgraded due to this. And uh, importantly, there's, there's, of course, implicit and explicit safety uh, concerns given the travel through as well as other aspects concerning to air travel. You could see the destruction of the world's largest aircraft right there in the bottom. Uh, unfortunately, it was destroyed. Um, airlines were, is going to is is a big part in, uh, of the effect uh, of of uh, this conflict. Uh, closure of airspace, uh, passageways, um, uh, the increase in costs of four airlines incurred to go around the airspace, uh, both in terms of fuel, crew, flight time, depreciation, uh, as well as uh, insurance, actually insurance uh, of flights uh, if they're traveling through. These are all issues that airlines have to deal with. Um, uh, also, uh, there, there's a lot of cargo airlines in uh, rushed by Russian operated airlines. And this, uh, during a time when cargo is, is in need, uh, this has created uh, definitely some, uh, some <clears throat> supply issues. In, in the marketplace. And, and with that, there's also the, man, from the manufacturer's perspective, there's a lot of cancellations of orders of, from, uh, from Air, Air Russian airlines uh, and cargo, cargo players. And this has uh, created uh, a, a big chunk of orders that, that came out of the backlog uh, from the two major uh, manufacturers. Uh, another major in, impact is is the commodities, the raw uh, commodities of titanium, as well as uh, these joint ventures that the manufacturers had locally in in Russia. So with with that, uh, let me 
let me uh, uh, hand it over to Tassos and he can uh, give uh, everyone a little bit more uh, flavor on, on, on the insurance side. Thank you, David. Um, the audience will be well versed in the uh, offerings in the aviation insurance market, uh, but I've laid out generally the, the main uh, headline types of insurance that are available in the marketplace. Um, uh, relevant to our discussion today, of course, is hull uh, loss or damage of the aircraft, but it, ex it always excludes uh, war and confiscation. Uh, that would need to be written under a, a separate policy. Um, there's hull war risks and allied perils, uh, and I say here it covers atomic detonation, but it actually doesn't cover atomic de detonations. What it means is that uh, uh, if there is ever an atomic detonation in the world, all of the world's uh, aviation insurance will automatically be uh, cancelled. Uh, and I am aware of some ongoing discussions as to uh, whether a theatre nuclear weapon would uh, in some ways um, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow the, the, the industry to continue uh, or whether that would uh, uh, fall foul of the current regulations, which I, or, or, sorry, current uh, contractual obligations, which I think uh, it would. So a nuclear detonation would, of course, cancel all of the world's insurances. There's contingent liability. Of course, that's third party liability and claims. And there is specific war risk cover, uh, but one point to note that uh, the events in Ukraine and Russia currently uh, are not a war, uh, according to the United Nations. So um, before you can action your war risk cover, uh, there's a, a definition that needs to be uh, um, uh, agreed uh, as to what's going on. And if it's not a war, then you may not be covered by that policy. Um, historically, uh, when I have uh, leased aircraft, there was uh, many years ago always the option of political risk cover. Uh, it tended to be expensive and uh, rarely used. Um, we'd use it in places uh, like Yemen, um, uh, in Russia to some degree, in Ukraine. Uh, but it, it was always um, an add-on and rather an expensive add-on and generally um, most people didn't uh, avail, of, avail themselves of that uh, cover, but would have been quite helpful in these circumstances. And then there are of course other add-ons, things like repossession insurance, which of course uh, when one is facing all the costs of, uh, of arguing uh, uh, the current claims would have been a useful tool. Uh, but uh, again, even those policies are quite limited and have caps. And all of these policies can generally overlap. Uh, and one general observation is that um, uh, I, I, I've looked at quite a few policies uh, and claims uh, with the parties that I've been speaking to, um, approached maybe 45 different leasing platforms. Haven't seen the documents from all of them, of course, but have some ideas as to uh, uh, some of the claims. And of course, some of the information is is, is public uh, knowledge now that it's been filed. Um, but uh, the devil will be in the detail and uh, um, each of the policies is a little bit different. Uh, and some of the policies just don't cover the, the current circumstances. Uh, slide, please. So who arranges cover and how is it placed? And, and generally it's the airlines and the lessors. The financiers are usually covered under uh, those two uh, headings. Uh, and cover is generally placed with one of the uh, uh, brokers in the marketplace. Um, and it runs year to year and generally follows the calendar year. Um, so we've had uh, um, a, a lot of renewals recently. Um, uh, one po uh, point to, no uh, to note is that the market was very tight last year because of all the claims that arose uh, due to natural disasters around the world. Uh, and property insurance is the, is the biggest category uh, of uh, cover in the marketplace. Um, and that's had a knock on effect on, on other areas um, with, uh, uh, with the insurers having lost uh, vast sums of money. Uh, they're either looking for new places to, uh, to write business or they're looking for new places to recoup uh, losses. Um, uh, insurance is then written by underwriters. And uh, again, growing up, we had the names at Lloyd's. And these were just in wealthy individuals um, who would uh, invest and, and pretty much give a blank check um, to ensure that if there were any claims that they would be paid out. Um, uh, but whilst there are uh, you know, some corporate uh, 
uh, names now. Uh, there are still individuals who are uh, involved in this business. And so uh, the brokers would approach the, the underwriters, uh, who can be a very international group, and they would each take a slice. There are people who like to insure the, the undercarriage and there are people who like to in, insure the uh, APU and the interior of the aircraft and basically uh, a, a policy is, uh, is constructed. Uh, and of course, underwriters can rebroker the risk and um, uh, uh, the uh, reinsurers are another market, another group of people, a much smaller group of people uh, who take on the risk from the insurers. Uh, and generally, um, depending on where the, uh, uh, the where the rates are, um, that market either grows or or uh, withdraws. Um, also, to do with the uh, perception of risk, um, so the risk can be sold down to these reinsurers, uh, and uh, um, it, they will, uh, you know, gladly take up some of the uh, slack from the from the underwriters. Uh, with the underwriters generally uh, making a margin uh, on the trade. Um, just to give you uh, an idea, um, in the early 2000s, uh, reinsurance was, was particularly cheap. People like uh, Fortress Re were out there um, bringing in uh, investors. Um, of course, following 9-11, um, they all lost uh, large sums of money and uh, um, the, the market rates changed uh, again back in 2000, 2001. The changes in uh, um, in policy premiums, I think they rose by around 650%. Um, and uh, so one should never forget that the market can be limited. And whilst the events in Russia are a, are a huge problem for the industry, uh, the industry needs to continue to function. Uh, and a lot of the parties that are, are now affected uh, by the rising rates uh, may have been parties that never had any exposure to Russia uh, or Ukraine. Uh, slide, please. So like any contract, the wording is, uh, is, is of fundamental importance. And uh, I've alluded to the fact that some of the policies that I've seen are, uh, shall we say, lacking maybe in, uh, in detail or in clarity. Um, so uh, generally the industry has tried to adopt um, standard format mats and ABN 67B is, is, is one example. Um, but you know, policies can become bespoke and uh, uh, there's um, a lot of room for interpretation. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, worries me always about litigation is the people who, who had the file were working for the leasing company or for the uh, brokerage at the time when the policy was written may not be working for them uh, going down the line if the litigation goes on for years and years. Um, Marsh McLennan uh, wrote most of the business interruption policies in the UK during the uh, pandemic, loss of profit, business interruption. Uh, there were exclusions and there were, uh, you know, uh, discussions as to what would constitute a pandemic. 40% um, of the policies in that uh, scenario were bespoke uh, and I wouldn't say industry standard. So it, just in the, as in those cases, there will be, as I say, a lot of room for interpretation as to what of all of these uh, insurance policies um, cover. Um, and it also makes class actions very difficult because each policy is so different. Um, during the Kuwait war, and we can talk a little bit about that uh, in different headings uh, in this discussion, uh, that was an instance of 15 aircraft uh, being uh, lost uh, and taken away by the Iraqis. Um, uh, the cover was international, but nobody foresaw those circumstances, really. Um, so there will be huge evidential uh, burdens in the discussions uh, around these insurance uh, uh, policies. You know, what was covered? Uh, does the wording cover the, the events on the ground? Um, and was everything done correctly um, in order to uh, um, justify a claim? Um, Issue to the policy is, of course, always uh, relevant and multiple jurisdictions complicate matters because um, whilst you might find somebody sympathetic in one jurisdiction uh, that gives you judgment, you've then got to go and enforce that judgment uh, internationally uh, and they may take a very different view. Um, 
there's also a public argument here. Um, and uh, uh, whilst I was never a litigation lawyer, I have sat in court a few times and, you know, judges uh, can be swayed by the, the greater good argument. You know, do you want to collapse the insurance market uh, or, or uh, do you want to reward the uh, um, uh, the uh, lessors that have been deprived of their property? So uh, it's by by far from clear as to how this will play out. Um, and we can look, we can discuss some of the other factors that might uh, affect claims uh, going forward. Uh, slide, please. So this is an example of the revenues of the of the largest players in the marketplace in 21. Uh, they were the numbers that I, I was able to uh, uh, find in, in, on the Internet. And basically, uh, you can see that they were all pretty healthy, but one must remember these are revenues. They're not uh, they're not net profits. Uh, and when one looks at the um, uh, the amount of claims that uh, we're currently facing, um uh, it will so it will severely rock the market um insurance brokers of course act as intermediaries between the uh, the insurance buyers and the insurance companies and they act in the interest of the buyers uh, uh, agents uh, represent the insurer um it, again uh one needs to look at the the chain of, of events and how these policies were put together um, uh, to put into context, um, the potential claims are probably larger than 9-11. Some might argue uh, uh, more or less. Um, they're slightly different here because we're not necessarily talking about loss of life. We're just talking about the, the hulls and uh, uh, the, uh, the actual aircraft in terms of value. I mean, dwarf the claims uh, uh, during 9-11. I think the, the claims on the uh, on the airframes to 9-11 were about $130 million. Uh, and here we're talking about many, many billions. Um, and that's before we look at the other claims for, 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 for losses and damages. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, how big a hit it is on the market, uh, this is historical and it's uh, of, a, of an incredibly um, high magnitude. Um, of course, insurers do have uh, reserves for claims. Um, one would imagine that some of the claims will be uh, settled going forward, uh, but there's certainly um, no rush to settle at the moment because there are just so many questions. Uh, and those questions uh, could be as to quantum, they could be as to uh, uh, causation, uh, they could be as to mitigation. Um, so uh, we are far from having a clear picture uh, because this is pretty much uncharted territory uh, for most of the market. Um, we have seen, of course, in Sri Lanka um, uh, with the Tamil Tigers destroying aircraft in Kuwait uh, and, and, and some hijackings, but uh, uh, this is on a whole other level. Uh, slide, please. So who takes the risk and again we've uh, discussed briefly that uh, uh, insurers uh, evaluate and assume the risk for a fee uh, they can then sell on to um, uh, reinsurers and secondary underwriters um, uh, generally there's an arbitrage between the two trades um, we've talked about the lloyd's names um, ultimately um, the credit worthiness of all these different parties uh, needs to be investigated. I remember years ago uh, a policy where uh, the airline was European, the cover was being written in Argentina, and then it was being reinsured through London. So you've got to look at the uh, uh, at the causal chain there and see, you know, who is taking what risk and uh, uh, whether they're good for the claim. Um, nobody's really talked about, um, you know, filings, Chapter 11, etc., or even bankruptcies in this area. But uh, there certainly will be some parties that will be on the brink um, if if these claims were all to be paid out, um, and that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, slide, please. So, in conclusion, uh, what I would say is that uh, um, uh, there is definitely a fight that's going to um, occur between the parties. 
Um, uh, the parties were entitled, or some of the parties were entitled to cancel insurance policies. Following 9-11, um, there were provisions that were introduced to uh, uh, reinflate or reignite the market, uh, which allowed uh, insurers to cancel policies if they saw some black swan event on the horizon. Uh, whether the policies have been rightly cancelled or not is, again, a, a question of evidence. Um, but it's certainly something that has been um, uh, tabled uh, and a lot of the policies were cancelled um, before the uh, uh, sanctions fully kicked in. Um, so th there is an awful lot to discuss here and to prove here uh, and the evidential burden will be huge. So um, David, sort of over to you, and um, you know, happy to uh, to uh, talk about um, some of the main headings and uh, uh, where where this is likely to go. Sure, let's uh, continue this talk about the main questions that come uh, that has come uh, from this. So let's get started here. So, <clears throat> so Tassos, um, you know. Ultimately, there seems there's a lot of sanctions in place, and can you describe in general kind of what what is going on here? Uh, and and then we can uh, we can talk more about uh, its its effects and on on various parties. Tassos? Yeah. So I mean, there are there are many sanctions, and the sanctions were brought in relatively quickly, um, and. Uh, like all sanctions, they they tend to have a boomerang effect on uh, on on innocent parties. Um, so there are, of course, sanctions in the U.S., uh, sanctions uh, within Europe. Uh, the U.K. has sanctions. They all differ slightly, um, uh, and we could spend hours and days discussing the different sanctions. But generally speaking, they prohibit um, uh, the selling, trading, financing, insuring. Uh, and all the services related to uh, uh, aircraft operations for the aircraft uh, that are within Russia, uh, and in some cases, Belarus and uh, and Ukraine. Um, and uh, they mean that, uh, well, the, the, the end result, the net result is that uh, uh, basically uh, the aircraft are stuck there. They can't easily be maintained because uh, the Russian side can't um, obtain spare parts. Uh, can't buy spare parts unless they're already in the country. Um, and uh, it also means that uh, um, with the airspace is closed and with the lack of insurance, uh, it makes moving the aircraft very difficult. Um, so again, when we go back to uh, the discussion of, uh, of this uh, um, uh, forum, um, you know, was there was there a, a window of opportunity between the sanctions coming in and uh, the leasing companies recovering their aircraft, um, or, or was that window uh, lost in any way? Great. Do you have any else to add to the, uh, the impact on the source? I know you you mentioned a few, uh, but uh, do you have any other things to to uh, elaborate there? Well. Again, I go back to this right to cancel policies, and again, we'd need to look at the individual policies and the rights of cancellation within them. Um, uh, you know, from from my point of view, I think uh, um, uh, looking beyond uh, uh, the subject of uh, of this talk, um, it it had a knock on effect on other airlines, and, and and perhaps David, you want to comment on the closing of airspace and how that has affected. Uh, uh, airlines globally, um, you know, Russia is a massive uh, landmass, uh, and with the um, uh, with the airspace close to uh, many carriers, um, of course, that's going to have a, a huge impact. Absolutely, look, uh, this uh, closure of Russian airspace is 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 affecting those, uh, especially with routes uh, from Asia and Europe, right? Because it's uh, the most effective effective route, uh, efficient route is is through Russian airspace. Uh, what you're seeing is, uh, especially for Western airlines that they're basically going around underneath or over if possible the airspace and as i said earlier this just increases uh time uh, and costs uh and you see that <clears throat> some of these actually airlines are starting to consider opening uh opening uh, and going through through this 
uh, as well. So uh, lots of, lots of different aspects, but uh, but you you can see that so so like Chinese uh, airlines are still going through Russian airspace. So you can see this difference here of the same exact uh, routes, but uh, much different time and durations there. Uh, and 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 parts and everything else, uh, airlines are affected through all of these different aspects as well. So you know. Uh, <clears throat> Without parts and, and be able to maintenance, how do you? What are the effective covers? Uh, and who's going to cover it? Uh, this transit uh, through this, if uh, Western airlines are planning to re restart transitions uh, through uh, Russian airspace, comes to mind. What what comes to mind? I, I know that's in the news just recently is the uh, Malaysian Airlines uh, flight that was uh, shut down over Ukraine. So this is this is the. That's that's the the most negative result of of, of this uh, that could possibly uh, happen. Um, so it could, it could give Beijing carriers some advantage though, because of course they are uh, saving hours of travel uh, by being able to cross certain airspace. Um, so in, in some in some ways it's uh, it's upset the. Uh, uh, the field because um, you know, purely and simply because of uh, the sanctions, uh, some airlines uh, still have an advantage or have been given advantage that others are denied. Absolutely. Look, I, I think this has a, a lot of uh, different connotations, especially for insurers as well. Uh, do you want to quickly add to this before we move on to the next point? Um, I, th I think we can deal with it on the, on the next uh, point. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, so, impediments to recovery. Um, well, David, first let's talk from uh, from a, a, a geopolitical point of view. What's your view on uh, uh, on recovery? Um, well, geopolitically, uh, the world is split, right? You could see uh, the different camps that basically uh, people are coming through. Uh, you have the Western branch, and then you have uh, uh, you know China's supporting uh, uh, Russia, and then you see uh, folks uh, somewhere in the middle where they're 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 positioning themselves, such as uh, you know India and other other uh, countries, uh, some in Africa, etc. So this is not a just a one uh, one way street here. So there's a lot of different divergent views of, of what's going on. So. <clears throat> um, so ultimately, you know, Atasas, what what do you what do you think about uh, you know this from uh, from uh, from the uh, Russian operators' uh, perspective? Well, I think the Russian operators have been um, uh, quite reasonable, at least the the ones that um, you know I, I've either encountered or or have heard about. Um, uh, there have been approaches to sell their aircraft uh, to to buy the aircraft from uh, Western leasing companies. Um, and of course, they they argue, well, we would pay and we would maintain were it not for your sanctions. So uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a difficult uh, um, uh, question there as to how, you know, this will be uh, this will play out. Um, there have been, a, I think, some voluntary returns, one or two, but they tended to be aircraft that was stuck outside of the country. Um, there have been some parties that were able to uh, seize assets, and uh, uh, our, our good friend Jose Bramovici was one of the first uh, movers in uh, accredited agricole in seizing an aircraft in Turkey. Um, uh, but, you know, lack of insurance, lack of traffic rights, um, you know, the airworthiness of the aircraft, uh, have made those things more difficult, and also uh, for some parties, you know, the the litigation that or, or the, uh, uh, the the documentation that would have been needed to to move forward. Uh, some of the lessors are, are not very experienced, and uh, maybe maybe you can describe them as being in shell shock as to uh, as to the circumstances. Um, but uh, what what I would say is that. Um, uh, whilst the the will to reach some sort of settlement, because of course you know people are people around the world and they want to continue in business and they they look to the future and hope things will be better. Uh, I think the chances of any of these aircraft uh, actually coming out is uh, is pretty remote. Uh, and one of the things that um, uh, certainly I would argue is that there are there are a number of laws in the U.S. that prohibit the transfer of uh, computer chips. And uh, 
Um, you know, one of these is it's the export administration regulations, um, uh, but there are you know several others. There is the uh, uh, there's also the traffic in. Uh, um, uh, Foreign assets control regulations. I mean, they all have uh, <laughs> uh, uh, rather difficult to uh, uh, to swallow names, but but basically they prohibit the the uh, the transfer of technology that could be used for uh, military purposes. And of course, an aircraft uh, has a lot of very very useful components in it. Uh, and whilst I think there have been attempts by um, uh, various uh, leasing companies and uh, um, uh, especially some in, in Asia um, to, to approach the Russian side and say, well, just buy our assets. Um, I don't think that uh, permission for those transactions is going to be very easy. Uh, in fact, uh, I think, you know, politically, it's a it's a very, very um, uh, hard hurdle to uh, to climb over. Um, great, great. Let's let's move on here uh, to the next uh, 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 questions. Okay. So, David, how would you value these assets that are, uh, are stuck in Russia? Because again, having seen um, uh, some uh, documentation and, and heard about some of the claims, uh, I, I may even personally have a problem again uh, about some of the valuations. Um, so even though you insure something, as you know, from uh, insuring your car or your house, uh, there are lots of adjusters and there, are, there will be endless arguments about the valuation of the assets. How are you going to value these assets that are stuck in Russia? And uh, we don't know how they're being maintained. Absolutely. So look, uh, every, every, every uh, appraiser uh, especially ISTAD appraiser, uh, which uh, I'm certified under, uh, it will have their own views on, on, on the situation. And I, ultimately, it, it, there's so many factors that come in. And one of this is, is overall demand and uh, supply and demand of aircraft, of these particular types of aircraft. Uh, you get into di uh, dimensions of te technical uh, aspects of these aircraft, if you're talking about specific Valuations you, you're, you're seeing, you're talking about uh, is there records available? Can you, is there parts? Are, are they, are, are they, can you trace them back to birth? Uh, is there, can you even get a physical inspection in order to get the, to make sure that these things are, are available in good order? Uh, and that is actually much harder than, than it sounds. Uh, there's not much, uh, there's not many people uh, these days willing to, you know, get on a plane and fly to Russia, you know, to, to carry out these effects. So it makes it much more difficult. You know, overall, if you think about it, this, it's, it's a, it's the supply, uh, market supply and demand uh, imbalance. Uh, is it is it is it temporary or is it very longer term in in, in, rel uh, in relative to 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 these valuations? So these are in based on the different um, uh, the 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 fine ISTAT definitions market value where uh, it's not uh, <clears throat> it's not a prescribed balance of, of of supply and demand. So these these are all situations and things factors to consider. And, and there's just some of these things. Uh, and 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 ultimately, you're going to have to consider this valuation. What is it used for? Is it used for insurance uh, uh, adjudication, or is it is it is it? And who is it used for? Or is it just no use for normal uh, 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 financing valuations? So these are these are what definitions you want to consider is a teardown value because you, you don't know the conditions and it becomes where you, you get it back even if you get it back it's it's a quite a uh, in, in a very bad state um and you, then you think about okay if there's embargoes on parts is there issues with pma parts um <clears throat> that are put in that you're not is there canvas re-engineered parts there that are not fit for that aircraft and is there even uh, basically waivers, EASO or other waivers that allow for them? Even if you get the aircraft back and you say you assume these things, will there be waivers by the aviation authorities uh, to allow for these aircraft to come back 
uh, with these gaps in its um, in, in its maintenance and records. So there's so so many different elements, and I, I really uh, if this, you have the, really need to go on each specific case and and understand it and look at the various different scenarios that it will be under. It won't just be one; it will be multiple scenarios that you have to consider. So ultimately, I think uh, it's both from a theoretical and hypothetical perspective, but also from a real life perspective of, hey, what are these from, uh, um, so the combination. So I think this is somewhere where you, you should get someone who's really kind of experienced on both sides in order to get a, a bigger, a better, more refined picture on, on things. So, um, so, <clears throat> so Tassos, um, so Tassos, uh, uh, the, for, for what about the, on the write downs uh, uh, for, the, for, for the insurance permits, uh, what do you think? What does this mean? The insurance value, uh, the disease things. Uh, what do you think from from that perspective? Well, most of the larger uh, lessors have um, uh, written down uh, the value of their uh, uh, detained aircraft uh, to zero. Um, I think that there's probably a fair amount of pressure from the rating agencies. Uh, without um, uh, at least some glimmer of hope that these aircraft are going to come back uh, soon or that the, the conflict would have ended fairly quickly. Um, you know, we're, here we are a year down the road, so it's clearly things aren't going to happen quickly. Um, uh, the Asian uh, leasing companies, for the most part, have, um, uh, I would say, sat on the fence uh, in the hope that uh, uh, they don't have to take write downs, because again, these write downs can have um, an effect on their on their financings as well. Um, I mean, I've seen that also with the with some of the ABSs. Uh, it's all very well. You've lost your assets. You're not getting the income, but the debt is still there, and you still have to service the debt. Um, but I think in time, um, the other. Um, leasing platforms will be pressured into writing down these assets uh, in in some way, um, uh, because again, I just don't see any any quick solution here. Yeah, just to, to re recap, you know, this 527 aircraft out of 700 lease fleet that operates in Russia, you know, valued 10 to 15 billion uh, in, in total. So this is large amounts. And you see the 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 uh, basically the write downs for by the public um, leasing companies. The people when I say that publicly listed equity is publicly available uh, debt as well, traded debt as well. So you can see what what they're doing, and these are quite large uh, magnitudes already. So you know when, once you consider the you know Asian care uh, lessors, this will be a much bigger pool because uh, for. Uh, Asian carriers, uh, lessor, excuse me, have uh, have been, have now are, are now in the top uh, ten. Uh, multiple uh, players are in the top ten globally yeah. Uh, yeah. of lessors these days. That, that's right, David. And uh, um, you know, whilst the industry, uh, the insurance industry, is is setting aside some money uh, towards claims, I, I, I heard Lloyd's put to aside about one point seven billion, which. Uh, uh, is 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 way uh, very far away from uh, uh, maybe the total claims. Um, we've also seen the premiums go up, and in some cases, you know, I've heard of premiums going up by a thousand percent. So, uh, jokingly, in Dublin a few weeks ago, uh, with uh, one of the very large lessors, we joked that eventually they will have built up enough of a war chest with the new premiums to uh, to then settle the claims. Uh, I mean, that's uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but. The reality is that uh, this is affecting the entire market, and as I said, even if you don't have aircraft in Russia uh, now, you will be hit with these uh, with these higher premiums, and they're understandable. You know, the industry cannot, uh, the insurance industry cannot uh, just lose money. At some point, they have to recoup their losses. So, you know, we must see it from the. We're, we're an ecosystem. We have to see it from from both sides of the uh, uh, of the table. Um, and just as after 9-11, the premiums went up, um, you know, eventually they came down because uh, the market became uh, more competitive again. Uh, but this is a very, very large pill to swallow. And I think, uh, um, you know, we're probably going to be faced with with high premiums for, for the foreseeable future. And remember, Tessa says, it's not just, just to iterate this point, it's not just the lessors who are getting hit, right, with this, all these, yep. airlines themselves are also getting. Absolutely, uh, 
Absolutely. As well for this uh, contingent effect uh, throughout the entire industry. So we see this from uh, from just uh, additional coverage that they might have not needed before, but that also the existing coverage. Uh, existing increases. coverage has gone up. You're right, and uh, you know we're in an industry where you know your your profit margins are fairly thin. Um, uh, so you know all of these increased costs are going to make uh, life difficult for for the airlines uh, and the passengers, and uh, uh, you know at a time where we're sort of on the brink of recession around the world, um, that is not a helpful uh, factor. Uh, and I don't think it's one that's going to go away because, as I said, with the insurance industry, uh, they've had massive claims for uh, natural disasters. Uh, this past week, we've seen, you know, uh, the, the terrible events in Turkey and in Syria. Um, so, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's bad news for the insurers and uh, uh, and the insurers are going to have to regroup and find a way to to build up their reserves again. Absolutely. So uh, why don't we move on to the next uh, topic here uh, about uh, jurisdictions and courts? Um, you know, the, you, 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 there's a lot of news out there right now of various, uh, you know, uh, starting litigation between various parties in courts all around the world. So can you, uh, maybe you can test us, you can, you well, can. Uh, I, I'm, I'm considering renewing my practicing certificate. Um, there's certainly going to be a lot of litigation around this subject and there already is. And the costs thus far have been you know, very, very large. That's not because, uh, you know, people are taking advantage. It's just purely and simply because it's a very complicated subject. Um, so the starting point, of course, will be the, the policies themselves, uh, and they may have jurisdiction clauses uh, in them, um, but it'll be a case by case matter. And as I said, you know, the, maybe the, the 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 broker placed the insurance with one group. Maybe that in, that group has sold down their risk to a, to a, to another group. And all of these different parties are in different places around the world. Um, so how the policies are constructed will be of, of fundamental importance. Uh, and if the, if the risk's been sold on, is it the equivalent of a novation? Has the next party stepped in to the uh, primary obliger's shoes, or is it a case of uh, yeah, you know, like a, a lease of a property, you you fight the first party and then he has to fight the second party. And, you know, somewhere down the line, there's there's some money to uh, uh, to recover in the claim. Uh, enforcement will also be an international affair. Um, and uh, one of the huge uh, issues, I think, is, is the evidential, which I've uh, uh, alluded to previously. And again, you know, the, the, the party who was uh, in the leasing company uh, liaising and writing the policies, he's going to need to be around and he's going to need to give evidence at some point if it becomes uh, 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 litigious and, um, uh, you know, emails and, uh, and, and other electronic traffic between the parties has become of fundamental importance. Um, and uh, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, if I look at uh, uh, messages that I sent, uh, you know, three years ago, uh, I, I barely understand what I was saying, never mind, uh, you know, a third party looking at those messages and, and interpreting. So uh, there, there will be some, some, some pretty big questions there. Um, uh, and and the cost of litigation, especially if you have a small claim, um, uh, it's it's almost not worth it. I mean, you know, if you have one aircraft uh, with with a value in the tens of millions, um, you know, do you want to spend uh, you know five million uh, fighting your claim, uh, or should you choose try and settle with your insurers and uh, and find a middle ground? Um, certainly. Um, this is not an easy legal subject. As I say, there are sanctions, there are contractual issues, uh, there are you know cross-party issues uh, across uh, jurisdictions. Um, you know there there are too many questions here um, uh, for for most ordinary uh, lawyers to deal with. This is a this this is the sort of uh, transaction where you need a firm that is very international and uh, has uh, a, a wide reach in terms of its uh, knowledge and expertise. Um, uh, but but certainly at some point, you know, there will need to be uh, discussions and settlements and some very hard questions, you know. Um, 
So I, I, I would just tell everyone that, you know, if you think about it, there's Irish domicile companies that have aircraft <laughs> in Russia. There's, there's, uh, there's, you know, U.S. based, there's, uh, you know, Hong Kong, every, every jurisdiction you can think yeah. of uh, as the main jurisdictions for leasing. But ultimately, where is the, where are the, the insurance companies also insuring you out of? So th these are kind of complications. In, yeah, in, yeah. In, there's, so. uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, there are lots of um, twists and turns in this one. Um, and generally the market, you know, um, historically has worked well, despite all of these complications. But again, here you've got this added, added layer of the sanctions. You've got this added layer that the insurers were entitled to uh, to cancel policies. Now, whether they did so rightly or wrongly, I don't know. Um, as I say, that you'd need to look at the the individual circumstances. But uh, the the questions are far from clear. And even if you get over all of those questions, then there is the question of quantum. Um, and if you look at historically the the claims on on uh, on aircraft uh, hulls uh, hull cover, they 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 don't normally pay full the, the full amount that uh, the cover is written for. So there'll be many, many questions as to quantum uh, that will need to be sorted out, even if you get over all the other uh, questions. Um, and I think the lack of experience is the, is the big uh, problem that I see in the marketplace. Certainly the big leasing companies have all the wherewithal to, to deal with these claims. But, you know, as you come down uh, the list, resources um will some of these uh, entities survive because again if you've got um uh, a portfolio where x percent of your income came from uh, the aircraft in russia and they would have been some of the most lucrative uh in your portfolio uh, you're still having to service the debt some of that debt may come up for renewal at some point and you don't have the assets but you've still got the liability so there you know the, this this is going to be a long and drawn out game in, in my opinion and again experience and uh, and knowing how to deal with these claims is going to be paramount and uh, you know your local lawyer your in-house lawyer may tell you something but that's not necessarily going to be what's going to happen uh, in the long term this is uh, this is a very complicated area um, and uh, there are endless pitfalls uh, for the insurers as well um, you know the insurers are going to have a, a a huge burden in terms of uh, of legal costs and uh, one story that I tell people is I only once ever acted as a as a New York arbitrator and two and a half years into the discussion the other two arbitrators got so fed up of me that they decided to enter their decision without me uh, but then there was the appeal court and everything went back to zero again. And, uh, you know, this this is one of those cases, you know, there's so much money at stake and there's so many uh, different interests here that, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a very drawn out affair. So ultimately, remember about uh, talking about all the legal counsels, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, basically uh, sapped up and it'll be very difficult to find uh, yeah. qualified uh, people uh, to to represent uh, each of the parties, especially if you're waiting on the sidelines, right? Everyone has take, well, has already hired them I, for their own purpose. I, I contacted a lot of our mutual friends uh, in the different law firms early in, in, in this process back in uh, uh, sort of March and April last year. And uh, and these are friends and they're, they're people, as I say, that we both know. And uh, almost always the answer that came back was, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about this. I've already received a retainer. Um, so, you know, I'm conflicted and I can't uh, I, I, I can't uh, discuss this with you as much as I'd like to. I, I just can't discuss this with you because uh, I'm conflicted. And so, again, when you look at the uh, the number of jurisdictions and the uh, and the complexities of this claim, um, it, it's certainly uh, not ideal. Um, and again, you know, I think you need to take a balanced view and look at it from both both sides of the table. You know, the insurers. Uh, of course, you know, we'll will pay some parties. Um, uh, but again, you know, are those parties being reasonable in what they're claiming um, as to quantum? Uh, uh, even if those parties succeed, they're going to be paying higher premiums in the end. So uh, somewhere in there, somewhere in, in all the mess, there, there needs to be a middle ground and uh, we need to find some solutions here. But uh, uh, at least at this point, I think everybody is uh, fairly entrenched and uh, uh, fairly sure of their uh, um, of their rights. 
Um, I may be not so confident, but uh, that's just me. Um, but at some point, you know, experience will will, will be very, very necessary here. And, uh, um, you know, the problem isn't going to go away. So, uh, as we said, I, I think it's unlikely the aircraft are going to get sold. Uh, I could be proven wrong, um, but I think that would be, uh, uh, you know, a huge political step for uh, you know, European governments, U.S. government, uh, to uh, to say it's okay to sell your aircraft and uh, and for the Russian side to use those aircraft. I think uh, that's not going to happen. Well, with that, uh, let's uh, move on to our, our last main point for our discussion today. Uh, well, so um, what is the end game scenario overall? Uh, well, you know, one hopes that there will be. Uh, some form of peace uh, and sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but again, I don't personally see see that uh, happening uh, anytime soon. There could, of course, be a breakthrough by one side over the other, uh, and that might lead to peace. Um, there could be a softening of sanctions. I mean, there have been some uh, some sanctions relief in different areas. Um, although, you know, not much reported, but, you know, in the energy sector, in the nuclear fuel sector, um, uh, there, there have been some um, uh, some flexibility. We've also seen um, assets uh, or the attempted transfer of assets that were under finance leases. So there was this uh, reported case of, um, you know, multiple triple sevens that were transferred uh, in Ireland uh, under the auspices of some sort of financial lease. Uh, but again, you know, people are questioning that uh, transfer. And again, I'm not sure that it's that easy to uh, uh, to make those arguments uh, across the board, um, uh, especially for assets that are, are actually in Russia. Um, so a softening of sanctions could help us. But again, I don't see that on the horizon. Um, um, you know, personally, I think protracted litigation uh, is is probably going to be the only way that we find some sort of end game in this. And then, of course, as always with protracted um, uh, litigation, the costs will mount up and at some point the parties will get into the room. You and I are probably be sitting <laughs> at our, at the desk as well, uh, trying to find a middle ground in terms of values and uh, um, uh, and, and causality, and you know, hopefully, um, you know, good sense will will prevail, and there'll be some sort of settlement. But I think we're again quite far from that at the moment. Yeah, no, this long term aspect will will basically draw down on both. Remember, there's a running cost, right? As we've discussed with a lot of these, not just don't are, are owned by 100% equity, but they have attached debt and they debt has its own timelines uh, as well. So yeah. this will, will this will actually force a lot of um, uh, lessors, especially smaller players uh, who, who will, will, which will be overhanging to try to get some settlement and conclusion for this. Uh, and they've been even larger players, even larger players. Um, you know, there are some people with very, very large exposures. And uh, um, again, we, as I said, those debts need to be serviced. You know, the reserves have been spent, the cash deposits have been spent, uh, uh, you know, the, the deals may have been uh, uh, reworked with the with the lenders to uh, to give time and to avoid default. Uh, but uh, I think during the, the course of the year, we're going to start seeing, you know, more pressure. Um, and uh, again, there will be a need for action. Um, um, you know, there are parties looking at selling their claims, of course, uh, and, uh, and and recouping some monies uh, because that's the quickest way of recuperating, uh, recouping some of the uh, um, uh, the loss here uh, and using that money to, uh, um, to 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 dig themselves out of the financial uh, problems that they're in. Um, it, it also has a, a knock on effect on future uh, um, activity, things like ABS issues when we look at the abs's that had russian exposure they've all been marked down um and uh again until there are solutions to some of these problems i think it's going to be very difficult um uh, for parties to re-enter that market um that market's already got its issues with rising interest rates um 
but you know you add this on top and it it doesn't make life uh, easy for anyone so you know one would hope that uh, um, as i say there, there there's some uh, uh, realization as to the the current circumstances and and, and people have fairly grown up about uh, their approach but uh, you know, burying your head in the sand or hoping that uh, uh, things are going to go back to normal tomorrow, I don't think it'll happen. Definitely. I think this is one of those cases where it's better to face uh, reality in the sense that there's something you should try to find ways to mitigate your losses or, in, or to find ways to try to win these cases and, and get your your full claim yeah. if possible. But yeah. it's going it, to, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I, but if you're not even looking at it, I think that's where uh, things might go uh, opposite direction, right? So from that perspective. I'll throw something controversial in the mix. I'd say that within some platforms, the people who originally arranged the insurances don't really want to look. <laughs> They're a little bit scared as to what they might find in terms of uh, the quality of their cover or the, uh, uh, the the breadth of their cover and whether it covers the the current circumstances. Um, but you know, I agree with you. You know, uh, at some point there needs to be some uh, grown-up thinking, and, uh, and people are going to need to tackle this subject. Um, and the financing is a very, very good point. You know, it's the um, it's all very well arguing with your insurers, but you've still got to keep your banks happy. And uh, uh, you know, if you default with your banks, that's not going to help your rating and your status in the in the marketplace. Um, and at some point, you know, the banks are going to need to take a look at this, um, you know, whether it's because of Basel IV, whether it's because of uh, other regulations, but the, the banks are going to need to look at um, some of these portfolios and say, fine, you know, you, you may have written them off or you, you may think you're going to recover them, but in the meantime, what are you going to do about the debt? Absolutely, and this reminds me of uh, my experiences, and, and I'm sure you have some, a lot of them as well, of restructuring leases and, and, and especially during during uh covid where you know airlines are not uh paying but there is all the ticking time clock of the debt that's overhanging the aircraft uh and and, and so on and so forth uh, and, and the need there so you know for the most part we had the saviors of governments uh around the world which uh, stepped in from a covid perspective uh that basically helped a lot of people tie this over by the way, it's still it's still happening today, so it's not yeah. a problem yeah. that's gone away completely. Uh, it's just elongated the the, the, the issue. But uh, we let's see kind of where we get to our, where this end game uh, from from that perspective. Yeah. I don't see a government saving the leasing uh, world. Um, you know, I, I I don't think any Western government is going to bail out their their leasing industry. Um, because you know there are other people ready to uh, um, you know take up the uh, the baton in in this industry, but uh, uh, it, it will be it will be interesting to see how this plays out. But I I still think we're in initial stages with uh, with many people, and uh, and say the focus will be when you know every month you have to feed the machine and 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 have your team in place and be fighting these claims. Um, you know, how many parties are, are, are willing to do that over a protracted period? Um, uh, I, again, I don't see this settling quickly. Great, great. So I, I think with that, uh, we we uh, end, the, end the discussion and, uh, and, and debate. And uh, uh, so thank you so much for everyone for listening. Uh, here's our contact info if you want to shoot us an email or, or add us on LinkedIn, uh, you know, our article as well as uh, oh, uh, my, my book, that uh, aircraft valuation book that was published uh, last year uh, on, on the industry. So um, I think with that, we can open up uh, questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you, Tassels. So we, we do have a, a few questions that people have popping up. So uh, I, I don't know how we're doing with time. Uh, maybe we take a couple of questions from the floor play. And if we're still doing OK, we, we may be able to open microphones for some lively questions. So let, let, let's 
get to it uh, to start with. So um, there is a question from Ian Clayton. So regarding the 9-11, I think this is uh, this is actually a point raised about 40 minutes ago during your presentation around um, around the 9-11 uh, insurance situation. So what about the third party liability for properties and loss of life other than passengers? So it's, it's quite a specific question. I think he, he's interesting in uh, some of the points uh, that you made earlier regarding uh, uh, the obviously the insurance regarding the 9 11s around the aircraft and the loss, but uh, it's more around the loss of lives and properties that is the result of the 9 11. Well, in this in this uh, scenario, we're not talking about loss of life for these claims. We're talking about the metal. Um, so we're, we're you know we're we're in a business environment. We're talking about the the loss of the metal. Uh, I think I said it 9-11, one of the statistics I saw was, was the claim related to the actual airframes was only about 130 million. And of course, there were uh, billions of dollars of claims uh, uh, around those uh, tragic events. Um, uh, I haven't followed uh, uh, closely what uh, increases in premiums they have been for uh, the contingent liabilities. Uh, I think all the insurances have gone up. I just don't know how by how much they've gone up for uh, uh, for, for those uh, types of claims, but they're not really relevant here because um, the claims against the insurers and, uh, and uh, the claims being made are relating to the value of the aircraft. They're not really relating to the third party. Uh, what, what, what I would say is that, you know, I think there is there will be some contingent, some sort of contingent effect right throughout permeating throughout all the types of it, mainly in the sense of are we underwriting these policies in general too low and can we recoup some of the potential uh, payouts that we were going to have and also Remember, there's all these other claims that's been uh, that's happening. All these other aspects that they're 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 getting asked for money. So I I, I see this as an area that they're going to keep really actively looking at and finding ways to extract if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. I I, I duly recall actually just before COVID, the society, the air law specialist groups that actually organised the events, in particularly around the uh, 9/11 insurance claim and also the uh, the case settlement. And I think that session actually covered a lot of the points that these particular uh, uh, attendees have actually raised at the end that you have raised. So. Um, and it's some really good discussion there. Thank you both. So let's move on. I actually to other uh, other questions. So uh, we have three questions that's being actually raised via the chat uh, channel. One is actually from Peter Callum. So what are the arguments for for and against the sanctioning airlines that still transit uh, transiting sort of uh, Russian airspace without apparent penalty when Western airlines are sanctioned avoiding the Russian airspace for sanctions and safety reasons? Uh, is there any views from from either of you? David, do you want to start? Uh, I'm just more. rereading the question. Uh, I mean, I'll I'll start to. So, okay, well, start. Uh, it, it's it's a very difficult subject, uh, and it's more to do with politics than it is to do with uh, with aircraft leasing and insurance. It's uh, you know some countries are friendly towards one power over another power. Um, uh, you could try and sanction the airlines that are. Uh, uh, flying over uh, Russian aerospace, uh, airspace, um, but you know that might lead to uh, sanctions uh, for your airlines flying over uh, the sanctioned country's airspace. So you know, um, if there are Middle Eastern carriers flying over Russia, it's a little bit difficult to tell them that you know if you fly over Russia, we're going to sanction you. I mean, what have they done wrong? <laughs> They're just trying to earn uh, a living flying their passengers and they're taking the most direct route. So again, without getting political about these things, uh, it's very difficult to uh, um, uh, to advocate for those uh, sanctions. Uh, I'm not saying that they won't happen <laughs> because they could happen, but you know, there's bound to be some knock on effect if, if something like that happens. Well, I, I, I would uh, I would uh, continue the thought in the sense that you know, even if, a, if airlines do travel through, you know, uh, the airspace and uh, other people, I, I, and and you have the appropriate covers, right, uh, of of doing so um, uh, to protect yourself, the question becomes much more complicated. 
what happens if there's there's you know mechanical issues and, and things that yeah. you need to go down and and just and solve you know nothing nothing dramatic but then then there's all these other uh, scenarios which basically people are not really thinking of and yeah. that creates even more <laughs> complications uh, so I, I, what you're seeing is a lot of people are saying hey do we need all these potential headaches that we, we can't have and thought through all the possibilities and can we just keep it simply and just and, and go until things uh, clear up uh, more and I, I see you know a lot of airlines thinking that way because look uh, there's just so many possibilities and, and things are changing all the time so uh, this this part from a overall kind of brand and risk aversion perspective really kind of permeates uh, uh, from what I see great Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, the next question is, are you aware of any discussions taking place in uh, so between the OEMs and the CAAs regarding the waiver of airworthiness standards if any of the aircraft are subsequently recovered? I'm not aware of any specific discussions. I mean, certainly that might be a hope uh, among the uh, leasing community in terms of what happens if the aircraft uh, come back and certainly uh, you know, uh, I would have thought that that would be a topic of discussion between the parties, um, but I think it's uh, it's too early to tell. Um, uh, it's you know, airworthiness authorities don't easily waive uh, their regulations. I, I think it would be a case of aircraft coming back, being audited, uh, which would be a very long and complex process, and then uh, decisions uh, being made. Is it uh, and how big is the problem? Um, because if, uh, uh, you know, if the aircraft have been parked and then they're, they're flown out uh, under some sort of cargo ticket and then uh, um, uh, and then audited, then that, that's fairly simple. But if uh, works have been carried out to the aircraft uh, and we talked about PMA parts and David alluded to parts being manufactured uh, or, um, locally for these aircraft, then the question is far more complicated. So again, you know, I would say uh, it will certainly be a subject of discussion, but I think it's very it's it's too early to speculate. And and I would I would add that uh, you know reconstructing lost uh, records uh, time wise it's a very costly and, and uh, timely it takes a lot of time uh, endeavor. So even you know if that is go, people go down that route, you know, pending that they get the aircraft back, I think this will uh, make thing the equation, financial equation, go. Is it even worth it overall? So these all these add to the overall effects of of, of people's uh, financial decision making as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's a such a complex subject, and I think it's really well responded there, both uh, both speakers and certainly from a society's perspective. The our air uh, aircraft maintenance specialist groups are certainly interested in some of these uh, some of these air, uh, areas, and uh, they they may organise similar events in some of their conferences, which could stimulate uh, 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 discussions like these. Um, so the next question I think is more to Tassel. So what is your view with respect to the insurer's ability to pay claims to aircraft owners in the context of EU and other sanctions against Russia? Uh, as most insurer, uh, insurance have a reinsurance cut through clauses, does that make a difference or not? Yeah, this is quite a complex question. So in in Russia itself, when policies were written uh, and they were often written by um, local insurers, uh, there was an obligation to sell down the risk um, and they could only be left with a certain uh, uh, portion of the risk. So most of it was written uh, in third party countries. Uh, again, this goes back to the evidential burden. Do I need to have the cooperation of my uh, Russian insurer to be able to claim, uh, or is there some sort of cut through? Uh, and can I go to the 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 outside parties? It's when I mentioned the idea of a sort of novation. And I'm, you know, again, uh, don't profess to be the expert here, but uh, you do have a direct right to approach those third parties, or do I have to work through my uh, Russian insurer? Because if I do, the chances are they're 
not going to be very cooperative at the moment. But if, on the other hand, I can go direct to these third parties, um, then you know I've got a higher chance of uh, of claiming. But uh, if there is a percentage that's written in Russia, uh, and we know we can't trade with Russia and we can't uh, um, receive dollars from Russia. Uh, then uh, the chances of me getting that part of the claim are are very remote. Um, does that so answer I, your question? Uh, I, from, I, I would I would add one thing. I think that we haven't really discussed. You know, this ability of insurers to pay claims is actually a big question mark in general. <laughs> For I, I know you the technicalities of the of what you just said, but I we have to remember that this is not just one big lump sum of you know uh, of, of payout uh, um, uh, groups but it's a series of of groups and syndicates who have different pieces of coverage so they're not just one big pile of money it's multiple piles of money so we, we at a certain point if these claims do uh, find go against them these groups you know the it's a legitimate question is you know are, what is their ability is their ability to pay uh, given the historical low, uh, low, uh, low, uh, low payout ratios that they are expecting, so I, I think this will be something that will continue to be, you know, really kind of looked at as we continue uh, going down this route. Like I said, this is still in the early beginnings. We'll, we'll see a lot more on this. On this David, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Lloyd's do have a sort of central sink fund, uh, but that's for all claims. It's not just for 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 the aviation claims. Uh, and there's lots of money in that fund. Uh, the individual um, uh, names uh, may decide not to pay, and then you have to um, uh, sue them and find their assets and recover uh, the assets. Um, so again, this is why it's all very, very complicated uh, and not as straightforward. So uh, one uh, leasing company uh, that I approached mentioned to me uh, that they've won all their litigation in the last five years. Uh, and uh, I was about to thank them and hang up when the, the individual said, yes, but you didn't hear how much we recovered. Uh, and the answer is we've recovered somewhere between uh, 10 and 30% of the uh, 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 of the winnings um, because there just wasn't money there. Now, with the insurers, again, it depends on the quality of the syndicate. It depends. Lloyd's is maybe one of the easier ones because Lloyd's, as we say, have this central fund and the uh, and, and the people are jointly and severally liable. So uh, if the three of us are in a, uh, a syndicate and I don't pay, then the two of you have to find the additional money. Um, but uh, again, this is going to draw out the process and it's going to make the process all the more more difficult. Yeah, certainly. I, th I think we have a just very quickly go to the very last questions that are raised by the audience. I don't really think we have any time to open the floor uh, anymore. So this will be our last question in conscious of time. It's from Malcolm. So what will be the wider impact of those claims and the costs on airlines and the aviation industry in terms of the growing demand and its post COVID recovery? Well, um, yeah, why, uh, why don't I start uh, first, Tessas? Look, uh, if if uh, we've been talking about the airspace and the need to, for additional time. So any additional time uh, uh, utilization of aircraft and crew means less availability to go place them somewhere else, right? That's just uh, natural uh, natural laws of, of, of availability. So if that's the case, then you know, we know today there is a it's hard to get crew it's hard to get it's hard to get aircraft why because you know manufacturers have uh, slowed down a uh, delivery during covid and 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 that's just starting to come back uh, out and there's supply chain issues as we as we discussed uh, that was discussed earlier in our presentation so these are all kind of things that will do basically drag things out so overall this is not going to help the effect, knock on effects will, will, will not be helpful for airlines in general. Uh, we haven't talked about the parts availability and, and, and things, you know, the supply, um, the, uh, the inputs going to each of the supplies, not to the manufacturers, but to to the parts that are going into uh, the engine makers and, and, and OEMs, et cetera. So these are all kind of a knock on. So I think 
having the this issue is a knock on effect of the recovery growth overall uh, of uh, for the airlines and the aviation in, in general. So the question really becomes is how long is this lag period? Uh, when will it be end? When is this end, uh, end game happen so that we can get back to it uh, and the rest of the industry can can kind of right itself? Tassos, you have stuff to add. So. Uh what I'd uh, uh, like to throw into the mix is the fact that the policies that are being written now as, a, as an impact on the industry are far more restrictive than they were uh, before these events. Uh, just as after 9-11, where there were caps pay, uh, placed, there was a, a war risk limit of 50 million uh, per aircraft, and so governments had to step in uh, and, and help the industry out. Um, what I'm seeing with the new, uh, with the renewals of these policies this year, is that uh, there are far more restrictions as to uh, where the aircraft can operate, and uh, uh, and more restrictions on the on the terms being offered by insurers, as well as the premiums going up. So uh, they're they're paying more, and they're getting a little less, and they're they're only getting a little less because the insurance uh, have found that they have to protect themselves. Uh, and rightly so, because they again they're not just a, a blank check. Um, they need to uh, they they need to balance uh, um, uh, the concerns of uh, of both sides. So uh, again, you know um, there are there are big hurdles for 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 the airlines because uh, whilst they may not have been operating to Russia, may, whilst they may not have had aircraft in Russia, uh, it's affecting the whole market. Yeah, certainly. I think I think that really is um, concluding today's uh, session uh, of our 2023 Tony Knocking debate. So it, it is such a fantastic uh, uh, topic surrounding the aviation finance and the insurance market. We, we talk. I think both of you have covered a lot of the the grounds, and, and I think you can see the appreciation from our audience uh, who have uh, participated in today's session. So thank you to David and Tassos for, for their excellence and informative uh, discussions today. So the Air Transport Specialist Group is here to stimulate constructive discussions and debates on key issues affecting the industry. So I congratulate our speakers on achieving this today, and thank you, the audience, for making this event a success. If you would like to get involved and the, with the activities of the Air Transport Specialist Group here at the Society, please visit the group's web page on airsociety.com and you can contact the chairperson by emailing knowledge at airsociety.com as well. So I look forward to welcoming you to future events organised by the Air Transport Specialist Groups and the Royal Aeronautical Society. And I look forward to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Lynn.